This is, I'm really excited about this session. So we're going to change it up a little. This is going to be a sort of a free-flowing conversation. Um, you know, in our sort of uh, pre-session conversation, we were already talking for, a, for an hour. So we're just going to continue that dynamic. And uh, uh, towards the end, uh, we'll open up for questions. But uh, I'm not going to go one by one in terms of questions. We're just going to take questions and uh, let uh, you know our uh, steamed panelist comment on it. So let me, uh, you know, both of them don't really need introductions, so I'm going to be very quick. Uh, Dr. Ghazala Mansouri, um, of course, is the lead economist in the Poverty Reduction and Equity Group at the World Bank. Uh, extensive work on rural uh, land, labor, and credit markets, uh, participatory, um, you know, political economy of participatory development. Uh, and then uh, more recently leading a uh, really important work, and by the way, congratulations on the uh, country climate and development report that just came out. Um, really timely work uh, and very, very important. Um, Dr. Imran Rasool uh, is the professor of economics at the University College London, uh, director ESRC Center for the Microeconomic Analysis of Policy, at the IFS and co-director of James M. and Kathleen D. Stone Center on Wealth uh, Concentration, Inequality, and the Economy. Uh, he has been, you know, he, uh, it's quite incredible that he flew in this morning uh, to Lahore and has been talking throughout the day. So if we need coffee for him, we'll, you know, somebody please grab it, right? Um, so, uh, you know, uh, Imran's work on asset transfer and really understanding the, um, you know, how to think about targeting the ultra poor and really, you know, as we're talking about pathways to development. So, as I said, this is going to be a conversation. Uh, and often in Pakistani context, we think of rural economies as, uh, you know, low productivity, low mobility, high poverty. Um, but I, I think it's important to really understand rural spaces, right? And I'd like both Imran and Ghazala to talk about how should we structure our understanding of rural spaces, uh, labor uh, market dynamics, uh, you know, human capital accumulation, uh, land degradation, and so on. So uh, Ghazala, maybe uh, yeah. you can start. Yeah. Um, so I'm just going to continue from sort of, we had a very interesting pre-session conversation. And one of the things that's been on my mind a lot, and I'll start there, is how do we really think about rural areas? Uh, the predominant vision has been one of empty them out as fast as possible, right? These are terrible low productivity spaces. Um, bring them all to the cities, get them jobs and get them to places where you can provide them services in, you know, in, in, in relatively enclosed spaces where it's cheaper. And uh, that has been the dominant economic model for a long time. Until today, if you say anything about rural, people are like, aren't you going to say something about rural urban transformation? I mean, don't we have to transition these guys out? And I'm increasingly completely unconvinced about that. Um, I think that uh, there are very good reasons to sort of think about how we're going to handle uh, people uh, who live in rural areas, they are, for Pakistan, that's 50 to 60 percent still of our population is in rural areas. Um, they are, four-fifths of them are poor. All this is true. These are incredibly degraded spaces because we've degraded them, right? We've degraded them by ignoring them, by not providing them services, by allowing the environment around them to degrade, uh, doing nothing about solid waste management. So they're just all left there. Right, with very little policy attention. And if I look out at the future, then I think, all right, we're going to bring all of these folks, millions in Pakistan, into cities that are collapsing as it is. Right? Cities are collapsing. Isn't it? They can't provide services. They are barely able to provide jobs. Right? And, and, and we have a whole hu huge issue of food and water security. Right? So no matter what happens, and we, aren't, we haven't started talking about climate risk and environmental risk, but I think we'll have to get there at some point then you're going to have to face that issue as well, right? Is that we need to ensure food security. Someone's going to have to produce this food. 
and produce it in an environment that is livable, right? So let me, let me sort of start here and maybe I'll stop here and let Imran jump in and then we can go back and forth on this a bit. So I, I think, um, uh, you know, we're trying, trying to frame what's important about rural economies is, is, is a debate that's taking place in actually many countries. Um, and, and I tend to frame it in terms of like the importance of uh, place-based uh, policies. And so whether we should target locations or we should target people and move them to locations with, uh, with good opportunities. And so often we can think about you know, rural transformation as either the choice between investing in certain areas and driving forward productivity there, or thinking about whether people are constrained and they would actually optimally like to move elsewhere where the opportunities are. And I think Ghazala points out some very sort of key uh, challenges and constraints with that second, second view of the world, that it's simply a matter of taking people to opportunities all the time. In terms of thinking about opportunities in rural areas, ultimately growth to me is always about the productivity of labor. And so there are different ways to think about how to enhance productivity of labor. You can say taking as given the skills that individuals have, how do we allow people to complement those skills with capital, with other inputs to maximize productivity in a given sector they choose to work in. And so that relates to investments that we can make into agriculture, potentially in, in terms of how agriculture is organized, both from contracts, from inputs, from, from, from land rights. But another, and I think equally important way to think about the issue is in terms of the fundamental endowment that we all have as human beings is our labor, is our skills. And so thinking through the life cycle of individuals and saying, how do we actually change that process so people start with more human capital almost from birth, early in life, investments into schooling and primary uh, stages of education, investments into health, and so on and so forth, essentially to improve the skills and aptitudes that people have that then can make the returns to other policies that we're going to discuss much higher to, um, to begin with. And the area of early childhood development is one that I've worked on a lot recently and it has been very influential in, in my way of thinking about policies that have very, very high rates of return, higher rates of return than many other policies that we can think of on, on the menu of development options. Um, and hopefully we'll come back and be able to talk about that a little bit more. Yeah, I think uh, I'd like to unpack uh, the role of place a little bit uh, more, right? Uh, we were, uh, you know, and, and sort of dignity of people as well. And, uh, you know, Adala, you'd, in our conversation earlier, you had talked about, you know, sort of uh, feminization of agri, mm. right? So uh, we need to unpack a little bit. What does it really mean? Uh, what's the role of place? And I think Imran alluded to it. Is, it. is development only about moving people to, uh, you know, uh, urban spaces or non-farm activities or really embedding the work and enabling those communities to, uh, to find their pathway to development. Should I come in? Yeah, so I mean, maybe we can start with labor productivity because I think you raised, uh, that's a foundational issue, right? We certainly cannot continue with the level of labor. So productivity in agriculture is just low across the board, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and, and there are many reasons for it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about it tomorrow also in our climate and development session, but let me start here maybe a little bit, uh, start this off. Um, we have an agriculture sector that is completely captured by five crops. Right? And these five crops are sustained based on a, a slew of really expensive, inequitable and inefficient subsidies. So these subsidies really do not, and we've looked at this, they do not benefit the small farmer. So this whole hoopla about the political economy of subsidy reform, you know, it's just like, it's, none of this money is going to poor people. The wheat procurement system is a shameful business. It's basically uh, giving money to commercial banks and millers, and only large farmers interact in that system. The, the subsidy for fertilizers goes to fertilizer companies, right? Uh, and to importers, right, of fertilizer, almost none of that gets down to the farmer, N certainly none to the small farmer, right? Uh, you look at sugarcane subsidies, just full import subsidies, export uh, 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 sort of uh, subsidies, there are, um, there's the market is constant, the whole sector is crazy, right? Irrigation, and we can talk a lot about these subsidies. 
So agriculture is low productivity, but it's low productivity because we've made it low productivity, right? There's inefficient use of water. There's, there's, uh, our, our yields are, I think, up to five, five times below potential if you look at global standards, 2.5 to three times below potential if you look at just field potential of, of, of where we could be. Um, so agriculture could be made far more productive, right? And, and I want to just argue that, and I can't go into, we'll go into more details tomorrow, but given the climate risk we're facing and as important as the climate risk is, the environmental risks are just as important and possibly far more important for us right now, right? We've degraded our land to the point where I actually interestingly had 300 plots that I did some formative work for this climate report. And so I sent, I got 300 plots over Pan, or across Punjab, GIS tagged, and I sent them to ICRAP Agroforestry. These guys have the best global libraries of this stuff. So they looked at them and they sent them back to me all over Punjab, yeah? And they said that these, these plots were all either low or very low in carbon content. Now, at that point, fertilizer application is no longer useful. You can apply all the fertilizer you want, right? But the land, that, that's how degraded the breadbasket of Pakistan is, right? The Punjab, right? Where we say, okay, the land, you know, at least that land must be productive. So we're on the brink of a system that is unsustainable even if there was no climate risk, right? Um, our water resources are depleted, groundwater is declining, it's, it's contaminated with every effluent that you can imagine, industrial, agricultural, no sanitation, so uh, surface and groundwater is contaminated, making everybody sick, right? Um, so it's our practices, it's the way we are doing agriculture, right? And there are better ways, right? And those ways can increase farmer income very substantially, and they can uh, reduce the contamination of the environment and they can increase uh, agricultural productivity as in yields and actually they can and we can do all of this without all this fiscal stress right we have a lot of money that's completely uselessly being put in agriculture that money could be targeted to small farmers to help them transition and that's sort of really something i want to work on which is that we need to switch switch completely and go towards regenerative agriculture, regenerative landscape and rangeland man management, reintroduce agroforestry. Agriculture could become a very productive sector, right? And we need to make it productive and we need to, it to be good for exports, right? So it has to get out of these five crops. I could talk all day and all night on agriculture. Let me stop here and <laughs> let Imran take over. Well, I mean, Maru, if you made the link um, between place and dignity, and certainly there is a danger of place-based policies to give the impression that some places are ignored or less important. <coughs> and that ultimately, you know, in the UK we call that, you know, people who feel left behind because they're not part of the narrative of what we think of as being the transformation that the country needs to go, um, go through. And so that, that's, a, that's a key danger that you always want to try, to try to avoid. But where does dignity of work come from? It's not just from earnings. It comes from many other characteristics of jobs that we have. It comes from stability. It comes from a sense that you're contributing to something greater th th than yourself. So what has worked in agriculture? I mean, it's, it's interesting. You know, Ghazal is completely right that when we have distortions of prices, that inevitably is going to lead to a misallocation of resources. And then pouring in more money after that is just essentially has zero, if not negative, returns. And unfortunately, that is partly the history of agricultural extension across continents that there's very little evidence to suggest that it, it on, on average, the typical program is, is very productive. There are better ways to design those interventions, but there may be other interventions altogether that we can think of. So I, I'm, I'm thinking especially about the work of um, Rocco Machiavello and, and others, thinking about the growth of supply chains um, in different parts of sub-Saharan Africa and how that allowed the rural economy um, to develop and whether there are policy lessons there for Pakistan. So I think there are sort of two key uh, elements that are a recurring theme in lots of the case studies that they've looked at. One is the ability for farmers to upgrade the quality of what they're producing. Mm -hmm. But once you've upgraded, you need to be able to verify that quality. So to have those kind of complementary technologies that allow for higher quality crops to be verified, which then attracts um, big, big, uh, big buyers, and that's essentially how you can set up a supply chain in conjunction with creating cooperatives so farmers can supply 
higher quality outputs at scale and actually be paid for them by international buyers. So I think there's lots of lessons there that can potentially be learned. That's not really, you know, ne needs re, uh, the wheel to be reinvented, but it means that we need to think about sort of longer term joined up policies across different spheres and move away from just a simple um, approach of, of, of which essentially can distort prices and thinking of some inputs as being key, whereas in fact, it's, I think as Ghazala was alluding to, it's more of a systems wide approach. Let me uh, sort of, uh, maybe this is a controversial or pr uh, provocative question, but you know, uh, a lot of focus on productivity um, sometimes gets hijacked by agribusiness yeah. and private money and this whole uh, focus or entire focus, if you will, on productivity, right? And uh, Rosala made a really good point that, you know, um, it's not that you don't have the fiscal space, it's what are you using the money for, right? And I think a lot of this agenda setting happens right. by these agribusiness that, that have, you know, not the right in, um, uh, inclinations in terms of developing rural communities. Right. No, and I, I mean, I hear anecdotally, we don't have data yet, but I want to collect this data actually if we can, in talking about value chains that um, extension workers, people in the ag ministries of agriculture, people in the agricultural universities, they're all involved in some way in fertilizer and pesticide sales, right? They, or they're getting cuts or whatever, right? They're part of the same problem. Where is the incentive of these people to switch, right? Uh, because there's vested interests in all of this, right? There's vested interests in everything. So the beauty actually of, of, of this, is, and, and then let's talk a little bit about agribusiness and stuff, right? So globally, where people are switching, right? And this is happening on a mass scale in, in the US now and in Canada simply because the land is no longer able to do anything for you, right? You've really damaged it to the point where you can't get much out of it. So people are switching. As they switch, uh, big companies in the US are coming into this business, right? So the, the three big food companies now are all collaborating with regenerative farmers because they want to, and because consumers are demanding those products, right? Mm -hmm. There is both an advantage and a danger to this in my, in my view, because from, from my perspective, you, we need to build agricultural value chains that are equitable, right? And, and it's all, it's good, let companies come in. I'm, I'm not against it, right? Uh, but, but certainly not companies that want to sell pesticides and fertilizers. We really don't need it, right? We are literally mass dumping this stuff on land and water and, and just, it takes hundreds of years to get rid of it, right? Properly some of these pesticides. There's really no reason for it. And we haven't made the connection between what we are doing to the soil and what we are doing to our health, right? because those two things are un not unrelated, right? The nutrient content of foods has been declining steadily, and all of this stuff is making us super sick, right? So, so that has to be fixed. But let's talk about like agri-processing companies, for example, they, they should come in, right? But to do that, you need to do both to have equitable value chains where the small farmer can get the return Right? And that, how do we do that? So in some places, they've done that very successfully by making farmers cooperatives. It's, you know, this used to be an old model that be went into decay and a lot of disrepute, I would say, some 20, 25 years ago. But actually, there's been new work that these things work really well, right? And, and, and things like, you know, where you get a more, you just cut a deal that's, that's, that's done by a group of farmers. And so you ensure that they get proper farm gate prices. We, we, by the way, the value chain development is really important because we are wasting something like 15 to 25 percent of our vegetables never make it off farm, right? The food waste is enormous. No, sorry, 30 to 35 percent. For the cereals, it's, it's 15 percent, right? 15 percent of our cereals never make it off the farm. So all of that fertilizer and pesticide, all of that water, all of that land destruction to create waste, right? And, and, and not even contribute to food security or dietary diversity. So, so value chains definitely could be built, they would have to be equitable. And I think that to make them equitable, farmers have to have a say, right? If you leave them at the mercy of these firms, of these companies, I don't believe that's an equitable outcome or, if, or, or that's not the direction we would want to go in. So let me agree with one thing you said and let me disagree with one other thing 
question. So where I would agree is that it's not just a matter of resources. For almost any outcome that we, we're we concerned about, it's about being very smart with the resources we have. Mm. Really, the, uh, really the answer is just to throw more resources at a problem. You know, we can all have our favorite graph. We're on the x-axis. We have some measure of resources on the y-axis, our outcome that we care about. And you'll see huge amounts of variation for the same amount of resources, whether that's cross-country, cross-city. It's all about what we do with those resources, uh, not the resources per se. That's a little bit of a red herring. <coughs> At the same time, I, um, so I, I would agree that it's not about the resources. Where I would disagree, Maruf, is it, it fundamentally it's only about productivity. That's where we need to have a laser focus. Everything else follows from that. Achieving goals of uh, equity will follow from maximizing uh, productivity. In fact, I don't see a trade-off between efficiency and equity. You know, if we want things to be efficient, because then those with the most talent to create the most wealth for others will get the opportunity to do so. And it's only once we're in that stage that we have the opportunity to even discuss credibly about redistribution and to think about who do we want to target to help bring up others who are not so fortunate for, for no fault of, of their own. So I don't see a tension between these two. If I have an illness, I want the best doctor, I want to be seen by the de best doctor. I don't really care about their characteristics. I want doctors to be assigned efficiently, not necessarily equitably. Um, and the same, same would apply throughout the economy. Now where the issue comes is that where firms are exploiting the drive for productivity in order to enter and have market power over farmers, and we know that leads to very distortionary uh, outcomes, both in agricultural markets, and the same applies in urban labor markets as well. So that, that's the specific concern that we'd have there with, with agribusiness entering, distorting incentives in a way that benefits them, but is not beneficial um, to what the social planner or what might be socially um, desirable. Can, can I come in a little bit on, on, on another side of this, which is that um, on the... On the bulk of our farmers are small farmers. Either they're, they're small owners uh, or they're tenants, but they're small in, in, in terms of their operated area. Um, if you're going to make any kind of a transition in agriculture, which is, which is needed, um, while we should remove all of the subsidization, I think 100%, just remove it, it's not necessary, uh, we will need to support small farmers through the transition because uh, it takes we, we don't know exactly how much time, but uh, there ba there's varying estimates on this. But let's say it takes two years. Let's be generous. It takes two years to destroy your soil, right? For those two years, there might be challenges, right? They may have to move gradually. There may be yield losses. Uh, we'd have to support them financially. We'd have to think through what we do. So there is, there is I think, an upfront, think, clear thinking on, on making sure that the system is equitable may actually be needed, right, for that reason, right, which is that these farmers will not be able to make the transition without support, right? So on the one hand, you remove the resources, but then you have to make sure that the right resources are available directly to these guys, because it can take a bit of time, right? Um, and I just want to put one final pitch, which is that MRV systems uh, for carbon sequestration are becoming very, very good now, right? even in the last one year. So there's enormous potential for paying these farmers for carbon storage, right? Which would take care of most of your mitigation problems in a country like Pakistan. Yeah, and I think that uh, is a good segue into sort of this year sort of highlighted the devastating impact of exogenous yeah. shocks, right? I mean, um, pandemic, then, you know, floods, um, heat wave, and all these climate-induced changes or, or disasters, um, I think there is some recognition that this is not the first or the last time. And uh, so how should we really think about this food and agri-transformation, uh, I think we're talking about you know, removing subsidies that create perverse incentives and then reintroducing some way of supporting uh, one that matters the most, which is smallholder farmer. Um, but what should we think about in terms of, you know, this sort of regen ag, uh, sustainable agriculture, in terms of uh, also social and spatial differences, right, to exposure to this climate risk yeah. that we have? 
Um, and then, of course, nutrition and so on and so forth. There's so many layers to this and impact on health, uh, impact on education, so on and so forth. So maybe two, I'll take it from two perspectives. One is that um, while Pakistan has not obviously contributed to the, to the, to the problem, uh, we know it's at extremely high risk. And even if we have a very orderly transition, uh, globally, I mean, uh, extremely orderly Paris Agreement, 1.5 degrees or whatever compliant, through this century at least, uh, temperatures will rise and the instability of the, uh, instability of the precipitation cycle will increase, right? And that includes things like the monsoon changing direction, the monsoon becoming unreliable, uh, rainfall when there should be snow, all this sort of stuff will happen, at least till the end of this century and a little bit more. Uh, um, hope, you know, hopefully not after that, if, 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 the, if the transition is orderly, right? So the way we need to think is, is what I think of in just in terms of no regrets, yeah? Uh, which is that we should be taking actions today that regardless of the, of the orderliness of the global transition, that Pakistan has to do some things today to take care of itself, right? The kinds of changes that I'm talking about when you move towards what's broadly called climate smart, but I think more target in a targeted way, regenerative, by which we simply mean regenerative of the soil. That's the foundation, right? Because when you fix the soil, whether that's through forest, reforestation, that's through your glass, grasslands, that's through your cropland, all of this, when you fix the soil, you fix its water retention capacity. When you fix the soil organic content, the soil can hold an enormous amount of water. Right? So you automatically become both flood and drought resistant. So what we're going into is a cycle. There will be floods and droughts, floods and droughts. They will, that's very high confidence now that that's the cycle we are going to go into. If, if that's the cycle we are going to go into, then we need both the, the soil to be capable of handling the lack of water in a particular time and to be able to handle excess water. Right. So that's one way in which I think this type of agriculture could be. And of course, we should be thinking about micro storage, right? Rainwater harvesting. We think we're very, somehow we have a lot of water to waste. We don't, right? And we don't have any water for environmental use because we are using up all this water excessively in crop agriculture. Also, these systems that are more regenerative and climate smart, they don't need flood irrigation, right? Flood irrigation actually destroys the soil. So flood irrigation is a really good recipe for destroying soil because all the living organisms in the soil drown when you, when you flood a piece of land, right? So you have to dump all this external stuff on it. Uh, so in a way, to be climate resilient, you have to switch out of these systems. You have to create more, more, more green cover, more tree cover, strap the water in place so that it can handle both excesses of water when it comes. And, and of course, it can handle, handle heat so there's a six to, um, uh, well, actually, this is very interesting that people have actually taken the temperature of soil uh, when it's covered with mulch and soil that's bare, just looking at it. And in the summer season, the difference in temperature can be 35 to 40 degrees Fahrenheit, I'm saying. 35 to, so about, you know, whatever that is translates into in, which I, which I don't do very well in my head. But 40 degrees Fahrenheit is the difference between the surface temperature of the soil if it's covered and versus when it's left bare, right? So when I'm talking about these practices, they cover the soil, you always mulch soil, you never leave it bare, right? It's heat tolerant, right? So you have to create a system that is heat tolerant, drought tolerant, flood tolerant. That is the three things that are facing us, right? In terms of risks, um, and you can do that. And that's, and, and of course in the process you create a more livable environment, which I think is, is not a small, it's not a small win, right, that, that people live in these spaces, and these spaces can be much more livable, clean, healthier as well while, while, while we switch, so. So, uh, Imran, you uh, presented in your session the, you know, asset transfer and really comparing uh, asset transfer and then uh, unconditional cash transfers. Um, I know you're still going through the evidence and data around post-COVID, reality in these um, rural communities, but if you can talk a little bit about, um, you know, sort of resilience in the rural community and the impact of, you know, pandemic and exogenous shocks uh, like the floods. So I think one of the, the key things that I've uh, concluded 
after a decade of, of, of working on this project is that we put too much emphasis on consumption as sort of a key outcome that we want to shift. That consumption fluctuates, but even in these very cost-effective interventions, it's hard to get consumption to increase dramatically. But maybe that's not even so important, given that resilience really comes from assets that individuals hold. And in that sense, there may be a key distinction between <laughs> asset transfers versus um, cash transfers. Although the work that I presented um, earlier on today suggests that on the whole, for most outcomes, if you're averaging across um, most outcomes, you're going to say that to a first order approximation, the returns to both types of social protection are approximately the same. Mm. But the devil may be in the detail that at every stage when you provide cash, there's a little bit of leakage compared to providing in-kind asset transfers directly. So for example, we find that when people are given uh, cash over uh, rather than in-kind asset transfers, 75% of them say they plan to spend it on one of those types of asset transfers. Of those 75%, maybe 80% actually end up spending it on, uh, on some of those forms of assets. Of those 80%, typically they pay a higher price, purchase lower quality livestock as a result, <coughs> because they're just less well informed about how to evaluate quality. All of that then accumulates over time, and that may be hard for us to pick up, even over a four-year time horizon. And we're yet to look at the data post-pandemic, but that's where you could see a big interaction between the type of aggregate shocks we've just been talking mm -hmm. about and these small differences that accumulate over time in, in, in using assets rather than using cash to purchase assets. And it's really that purchase of, of, uh, of assets and having asset holdings that may be the key form of resilience that individuals have. And that's why I'd come back to what's the main asset that we have. It's our skills and our human capital. It's our health and, and, and the things that we're capable of doing. And that's something that the pandemic can't take away very easily at least not on, on the skills that individuals have. Obviously, there are big health shocks associated with that. And that's why I'd always put the emphasis back on building resilience by giving people skills. And that can start while they're in utero. And some of the most equitable policies, most cost-effective policies that dominate anything else that we can often think about and evaluate are those that start very early in life. And that's the key form of resilience that I think um, is, it, it is very, very cost effective and is a policy that I would promote at the top of the policy agenda for sure. Yeah, speaking of uh, human capital and human capital accumulation, I mean, you know, we're seeing in some of the studies that, you know, actually Fessel also brought up uh, was high inflation the environment is really sort of causing intra house allocation away from long term investment, right? Uh, whether it's education. Uh, and that has a direct impact on human capital accumulation. And, and of course, your point about, you know, you look at the floods itself, you have 650,000 women who were pregnant in these flood affected areas, right? And almost every month, about 70 to 80,000 births. So, uh, you know, massive, uh, that's something you cannot correct, right? I mean, uh, those uh, those things cannot be corrected. You know, you can rebuild roads, you can rebuild a lot of things, but uh, that just changes the trajectory of the child. So, uh, you know, uh, thinking about this in terms of high inflation and, and so on, um, you know, are you seeing that in the evidence uh, that with this move away from long-term investments uh, at household levels, um, this obviously will have a you know huge impact downstream. Yeah. Is there evidence uh, that is already showing, not necessarily in Pakistan but globally? Uh, how should we think about those things? I mean, there's always been the concern that the key metric that economists use for households to be well insured is to say their consumption remains stable mm -hmm. despite the shocks that they have. And uh, that ignores what a household is doing in order to maintain their stable consumption. They may be selling off their most productive assets. Yeah. And so we need to really think about you know, the static way that uh, households may be insuring themselves versus really exactly what you're saying, Maruf. What are the long-term consequences of, of, uh, of being able to maintain, uh, maintain consumption at some level? And we've known for a long time 
that in times of distress, households often do sell off their most productive assets. <coughs> I'm sure that's certainly the case for aggregate shocks that, that we're facing today. So allowing policies to jump in, either to protect that loss in the first place, or to insure against that loss in a rapid basis, would be very, very cost effective in, in, in the long term. But as you say, you know, early in life, those are years that you can't get back. The returns to investing there are very hard to, to catch up on later in life. We know from the work of Jim Heckman and others all around the world, we see decreasing rates of return the later we leave it to intervene. And the work that's been shown in, in, in Pakistan and other similar contexts suggests that those policies are very cost effective, um, even, even in these contexts. You don't need huge state capacity to be able to deliver these types of intervention. Often they, they just require very basic levels of knowledge basic levels, of, uh, basic levels of, of resource support as well to help households just smooth shocks um, in, in those particular times. So coming back to sort of this whole um, human capital accumulation issue, because I think it's so central, right? Uh, it really is going to have to be the foundation in a way of building resilience, right? And, and it has different aspects, right? Our extremely high fertility rate is not helping us in that respect. And we need to start talking about it, right? It's sort of disappeared into, into the ether. We don't really, I know we have a session talking about here, but on average from the policy conversation in Pakistan, Pakistan's a ridiculous outlier for this region. It's the whole region's at replacement other than Afghanistan. We are sitting at 3.3, right? That's a lot of people coming online that will have to be provided services, education, everything. We're already doing a miserable job of, of it, with the ones we have, right? That's one. The second is stunting, uh, which I think you, were, uh, you started us uh, very importantly off on, that the first 1,000 days, they say, right, are critical for, for a child. This problem, at the same time, is also intergenerational. A mother who doesn't have the right status is not going to be able to uh, carry through and produce a child uh, that's healthy, right? So, th so this is this is a foundational problem, and the foundation of this is the provision of water and sanitation, right? If you cannot provide basic clean water and sanitation to people, you cannot fix this problem, right? And we keep talking about, you know, getting uh, food, you know, add additives to food and these kinds of, all this is good, right? I'm not against it, right? But you're not, you can't give a child whose enteric system is already destroyed uh, a food supplement and, and get them. And that's why we see no, no, absolutely zero progress on stunting in Pakistan, right? Zero for all practical purposes, right? And we've halved up our, our consumption poverty rate, which I think Imran is making, bringing a really important point, which is what do we consider poverty, right? So is it just consumption poverty? Uh, because underneath that consumption poverty in Pakistan, Pakistan halved its rate. It's the, it's the regional success story on poverty reduction, right? But do we see, and we see that in other ways, we see consumption, we see a lot of consumption by people in, of various types, but our health indicators are a mess, our stunting's a mess, and school outcomes are terrible, really a complete outlier in our own region, right? I mean, it's, it's insane, right? So obviously something is extremely wrong with our approach to human capital accumulation, right? And as these risks are going to multiply, right, you could maybe lose your livestock, right? And people did. A million heads of livestock were lost in this flood. You could lose your housing. Two million houses were lost, right? But your, the skills that you have acquired, the, the vigorousness or health of your body, right, that is one want, that's going to carry you through to the rebuilding, the reconstruction, all of that. And I think we really have to get very serious about this, uh, this issue. Uh, it's a resilience issue. It's actually a climate survival issue, um, uh, apart from the fact that it's at, the, at its very heart a productivity issue, right? Yeah, and, and perhaps uh, another sort of provocative uh, question, if I may. Um, I think, you know, we are talking about human capital accumulation, and we're talking about, you know, resilience of rural communities. Uh, the larger question uh, in my mind is around, you know, really how should we think about development in itself, right? And should it really target uh, the most needy 
or should we you know sort of target uh, those with the highest potential um, and uh, so how should we f really think about development and and of these rural communities and sort of creating those pathways that's what I said before Marif. there is no trade-off between efficiency and equity targeting those with policies that would generate the highest returns allows us to address the other challenges of, of uh, you know, creating more equitable outcomes and making the worst off better off in society. <coughs> That's the right sequencing of policies. There's no point talking about equity if you don't have the resources to pay for those kinds of transfers. How do you generate those transfers? Allow people to build capability themselves, build their resilience, allow them to ha take up the opportunities that you're providing them. That that's the, that's the best way. Any effective development policy, asset transfers, cash transfers, have very heterogeneous impacts across households. Mm -hmm. I don't know one policy that has uniformly beneficial impacts on everybody. So there are always targeting issues here. And that brings us back to where we started from, I think, in terms of targeting policies by place or by people. Uh, <coughs> um, but you know that's always going to require evidence to understand what's the best way to target, what are the criteria we should use. And uh, you know, in some cases, it's going to be, let's do the simplest thing rather than worry about ineligible people getting access to a policy and really devoting a lot of time and effort to those so somewhat second order issues and saying, on average, this policy is going to be very effective for those who get access to it. Let's focus in on those basic things. To go back to a point that Ghazala made before about you know, adding nutrients to food. I often think of that as sort of a class of very exotic policies. That's great, it works. It's really not part of the big picture. Let's focus on water, let's focus on human capital. There are a few basic things that we can do. Once we've done all of those things, then we can talk about nutrition supplements and things like that. So I'm gonna uh, open the floor uh, in a bit. Um, one question I have, and institutionally, there's a little bit of uh, digression if you're gonna allow me is around, uh, you know, and we really struggled when we talk about exogenous shocks. We, um, you know, at SERP, uh, when the pandemic hit, we launched this economic vulnerability assessment, right? And, um, you know, the, the, the challenge was, of course, you know, a fiscal space of an institution allows you to do, you know, so much. But um, a lot of the challenge was that we really don't systematically collect data in Pakistan. Right, and or some kind of a high frequency survey that yeah. allows you to understand the baseline, right? We saw, saw massive income shocks of 39%. Uh, we saw you know, mental health issues, all sorts of things that you could sort of create actionable policies around, but we really lacked uh, that baseline data. And of course, there are a lot of studies and incredible work by lots of researchers. But I'd like to sort of just before I open the, the floor, get your thoughts around uh, the value of this sort of high frequency survey for researchers, for academics, and, uh, and from a purely policy perspective, uh, the insight that it would bring for us to connect it to the policy side. Do you, do you want me to? Sure. Okay. My experience with high frequency surveys is that I currently also work on Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. And when August last year, when the Taliban took over, um, we, uh, we were able to launch a survey within two months that went nationwide. It's pure luck, we had phone numbers for all of the households that were in their national household survey. Just the simple act of collecting the phone number and sharing it and we were able to reach all of them, thousands of, house, thousands of them. Of course, there are issues with phone numbers are off, people are displaced, but we were able to create a representative sample and we are running that every four months. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're getting data on primary school attendance by girls and boys, secondary school attendance, health, uh, who's getting to health facilities, which type of health facilities, what's happening to salaries, who's lost what jobs, who's doing work. And the, the first round of that survey actually guided the global response uh, to how should we now deal with it. Because you know, the World Bank, everybody just walked out and they were like, okay, now what do we do, right? Nobody knew what, and then there were all these stories and the anecdotal stories were completely different from our survey results in many respects. So I think it's very important to have this type of data. I mean, the other thing, the effort we tried to do in COVID 
It was very limited, though, in the end. We didn't have the phone numbers. We tried to collaborate with the phone companies. Remember, all of, many of us were part of that drama, right? And the phone companies a little bit collaborated with us, a little bit pushed back, and then they just put their hands up and said, sorry, it's not legal, you can't, right. you can't do our systems. So I think it's super important. Uh, we need to create, especially now, right? Like we're trying to now understand flood uh, issues, right? Uh, uh, also recovery from the flood, right? And we don't have the databases in Pakistan. We'll have to create them. But, but, we, but I just want to put, say we do have the NSER, just to sort of be honest about it. And that does collect phone numbers which means in principle, we have the phone numbers, if not of 100% of households, of 75 to 80%, and those cell numbers are probably valid because of all our regulatory uh, constraints on phone numbers. So why can't we use that? We asked that during, during COVID also, right? That why can't we use that? Never could get it. But that's the real database we have. We could, we could use that. All right. Um, so let, 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 wanna, let me put a slightly uh, contrarian view then. Um, <laughs> So I think the pandemic was a great example of people using their initiative to generate lots of real-time data, which was incredibly helpful and useful. And I'm really glad to see, you know, academics took the lead in, in setting up those um, data collections, many of which have la lasted longer than the pandemic and have huge social returns that can't be undervalued. But I, I don't want us, when, when thinking about uh, data, as an academic, you know, I end every paper by saying we need more data, we need more research. <laughs> So after a while, it becomes a little bit tiresome, but also you become introspective and say, is that really the right answer here? Mm. And it goes back to what we were saying before. Information is power, but it's really what you do with that information so that really matters. So, you know, we, I, you know, you look at different countries' experience. So I'm just going to talk about the European context during the pandemic. The UK has very good data very remarkably real-time data, whereas in countries like Belgium, it takes you know, a year to find out death rates. So, but did the UK have a better policy response to, than Belgium? I, I don't know, because mm -hmm. in a sense, we didn't really utilize our data in the way that we should have done. We didn't actually say there are other things that are also important, as well as evidence. Much as I'd like to say evidence is the only thing that policymakers should take account of, <coughs> it's not. When we were talking earlier about agribusiness, that's not a matter of evidence. That's a matter of like p the political economy of the mm. situation. Mm. So evidence has a role to play, but there are many other institutional structures that we need in place to really allow the returns to information and evidence to be maximized. And so it's nice in a, you know, an audience of academics to say, we need more data, let's go and collect things. That's great. But we shouldn't forget about all the other things that are complementary to that to ultimately get that long causal chain of getting the most effective policy in place. So I'm going to open the floor for questions. Vessel, you had a question. First, you would. things. Yeah. So for example, breastfeeding initiation rates in Pakistan are very low, 18% or something. Six months of exclusive breastfeeding could yeah. change the needle on uh, malnutrition and so on. And two, two years Absolutely. of um, breastfeeding with some supplement could change a lot of things about stunting as well. That's one. It doesn't require investments. It requires something else. And mm -hmm. what I'm trying to get at is what is that? Uh, the other part of it is there are s the other areas like water clearly needs investments now. Uh, good sources are very hard to come by and so on. But the importance of something like water is clear. I think there's not a single argument that can say what drinking water, et cetera, is not. Why are this sort of informational and other investments not being made when the uh, returns are so clear? Uh, should I, is, I, I can start and maybe like, so, um, there's a lot we could do with providing targeted and relevant information to people, right? So this, uh, uh, bre breastfeeding is an excellent example, right? In fact, over time, globally, people moved away from it. Why? Because of all the companies that came in with their, with their formula milk and wanted to tell women this would be the best thing in the world, right? 
Um, so switching people back to that idea. But I want to also just say that, um, and this is really important because it's something that I discovered was very surprising to me, that there is a good bit of work now showing that exclusively breastfed children, exclusively breastfed children, have up to three really bad pathogens in their guts already, right? And how are they getting there? Mouthing, basically, baby mouthing behavior, right? Hands, mother's hands, baby's hands, back to behavior change, right? We have to give information to people. This can't be solved. I mean, of course, if there, so it's also about animal waste. It's not just about water, it's about sanitation, right? And people still tell me when I talk about this and say, uh, okay, we'll get water. And I'm like, no, no, we're talking about sanitation, right? You have to fix the sanitation system. So, you know, that, that you don't have animal waste mixing with children and so forth. So I think this is really important. I think behavior change interventions are critical. And I see no reason why we can't do them on a mass scale, mass scale, right? Continuous targeted information for a low literacy context, right? And what are the harms? Of, what are you doing to yourself by not doing this? And what, what can you do um, uh, to prevent at least some of this basic stuff? So I really couldn't agree more. There are so many issues like this that can be addressed with behavior change. I think there was a question in the back. And please uh, introduce yourself and uh, affiliation. Uh, this is Rahmat Wali Khan. I'm working with uh, Civil Services Academy as Deputy Director of Pakistan Administrative Service. Um, I have been listening to a number of presentations since morning. What I found is that uh, we have a good bunch of researchers with excellent communication skills and updated information and data. Uh, my question is, where do we fail in making tangible sort of uh, impact in the lives of the ordinary people of the country? What's the utility of the information and data that Dr. Imran also referred to in the last uh, part of his talk? How can we put the theory into practice to make some sort of, to get some sort of tangible outcomes? Thank you very much. Yeah. So I, I think that the challenge is real and it's not specific to Pakistan. How do we translate research into policy, into action? And that means uh, at least two elements. One is to understand that you know, evidence is one part of a larger set of in, uh, you know, uh, ingredients that go into policy making. So for uh, academics to understand what are those other ingredients, what are the incentives of politicians, <coughs> what is the capacity of the bureaucracy to actually deliver this. this but the second element, I think, is also, uh, again, comes back to human capital. And you know, organizations such as SERP, I think, do a wonderful job at this of trying to link the two together and actually fostering that kind of bridge between the two, where we can have this two-way dialogue, where people can actually present their work, people can actually see what, what a sort of policy demands, is sort of the key missing link in most countries. Pakistan is really not specific in, in that way. And it's a challenge wherever I go to. I mean, in the UK, we have the Institute for Fiscal Studies that kind of tries to play that role. But every country is kind of struggling with this. How do we translate what we know to what we actually do? And, you know, Stefan Durkon has a great book on, on development of how it's not just evidence that we require. It requires sort of a grander coalition of politicians, of bureaucrats, or firms who want outcomes to improve. And if you can get that sweet spot of being in that corridor, then providing the right evidence to the right people at the right time can be incredibly powerful. But it does require all of those elements to come together and for each element to understand that there are bigger ingredients than just what they're focused on. I think there was a question on this side first, and then you were next. <laughs> we can go, uh, you can go next, and then uh, the gentleman on the, on the left. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ghazala. I'm so glad that you were talking about regenerative and conservative, uh, conservative uh, agriculture farming techniques. Uh, as you may know, uh, it, it is very much scientific and um, people are practicing it all across the globe and you've mentioned about Canada and US in particular. Uh, and then the, the organic farming itself is becoming another industry uh, in the world and uh, unfortunately another industry and they are selling the pesticides again okay. in, with the name of organic pesticides. So uh, my question is, uh, what is stopping governments like us, uh, ours, uh, to, to at, at least educate people that there are other techniques than, than, than the con conventional farming technique that you are actually 
uh, practicing like uh, regenerative technique, the conservative technique, like paradoxical techniques of farming. Thank you very much. And by the way, uh, there are 82 million uh, farmers who are holding up to eight acres land in Pakistan. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so um, what's stopping? Uh, I think it, I think as far as regenerative and conservation agriculture goes. I actually don't think enough work has been done. So there are areas where we say there's so much research, but nobody's taking action, right? This is not that case, right? This is a case where uh, research is emerging, right? Particularly, I've been talking to people all over the US and Canada too on this, is that um, the link between, there's been a lot of work that's been in fields, in, in advanced sort of, you know, in field environments, and there's been work on farm, but all of that work has not uh, sort of been assessed and evaluated in a way that we could quickly take it up, right? Um, uh, for example, the link between, so a lot of people will say, yeah, yeah, regenerize is fantastic for soil, but yields will fall, right? And so how are we gonna feed these 10 billion people, right? The 10 billion people on the planet. And then there are many answers to that, right? We're wasting globally a third of our food and all of that stuff, that, that's aside, aside from that. So we need to do the research to actually show that not only does uh, farmer income go up, about which there's a great deal of consensus because purchased inputs go down, but that yields rise, and yields can up to double. It may take a little time because, of course, you're, you're fixing the soil conditions. So I think here is an area where we do need to build evidence, right? And there are some very nice pilot effort, efforts underway in Pakistan as well. We're hoping to actually work with them and do a proper pilot of this. But I think this is an area where, where evidence, I've been talking to people in India as well, they're trying the same thing. There are lots of people in India who are trying to build proper evidence. But it's, there's, and, and so that, that, I think that'll take the next two to three years before we have sort of more of a slam dunk understanding of this, right? Which I think will emerge. Thank you. Uh, this is Ajaz, I'm a mechanical engineer from Nurse University and uh, I did masters in energy engineering. Uh, this is about agricultural residue. My question is about agricultural residue. Uh, as uh, we know, uh, that out of this, these five, six crops that we have, uh, there is agricultural residue which is being burned. Yeah. And it is the uh, one of the reason of that smog. And uh, out of 25 uh, uh, most polluting cities of the world, five are in Pakistan. And uh, Lahore is uh, standing at, at number two. Uh, uh, so uh, one of the reasons is agricultural residue being burned. Uh, there was a study by uh, UNIDO in which a UCL professor, Dr. Gabriel, uh, who is working in Bartley Energy Institute, uh, they conducted the study and they uh, concluded that in Punjab, in 17 districts, uh, there is a potential of 1,000 megawatt of waste to energy projects in off-grid area. 30% of Pakistan is off-grid. And in that area where uh, a cost of uh, per unit electricity, uh, that is kilowatt hour, is more than 50 rupees a unit, uh, it, uh, out of agricultural residue, it can be generated in, le in less than 10 rupees. So uh, those studies are conducted by, but wh why those uh, studies are not translated into, uh, into the projects, into tangible projects? Uh, why World Bank and other uh, multilateral agencies don't push uh, for those studies? Uh, that was a 2019 study. Yeah. So uh, I think I'm going to take two or three questions, and then we can respond to them. There's another question in the back. Yes. Well, my name is Mahmoud Ahmed. Uh, I was working with the water center, but uh, right now what Dr. Ghazala has said, about regenerative agriculture, I have started a pilot on my own using private initiative and uh, community involvement. To be and fair I, to everyone, uh, yeah, hopefully I'm just coming we, to we that. can get to the now, question. Or... The question is now, we have already addressed one question was that, is there any pilot? We are already doing pilot. Then the second thing was that came out so good out of it, the rice waste, which People there were thinking what to do in, with government ban. We have showed to them that how they can use rice waste as a mulch, and now the results are very, very fascinating. I don't have time to detail it, but 
But my question is that uh, with the, so much interest that, okay, this is the future path, is the big donors like World Bank, ADBs, are going to invest in projects like this? Because still, the, the, uh, it's a bit sketchy, huh? I mean, uh, the, okay. the interest. Thanks. We won't uh, put Azala on the spot on representing the bank. I'm happy to answer that question. I'm happy to answer the question. Just hold problem. on. I think okay. Dr. Alia had a question, and then going Okay. 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 Sure. Uh, my question is uh, Vakas Paracha, Public Financial Management Advisor, working in Oxford Policy Management and currently working with Government of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa. My question is uh, the access to credible information and the role of government. So, whether the government is playing its role effectively, and if not, what what is required? Because the government officer he is effectively using the IT for his personal needs, but when he, it comes to the government service delivery and the government service, so he used to write on the note write letters and other things. All right, so um, maybe uh, in terms of the first question, which was agri residue and, you know, um, and smog, uh, Ozala, you wanna take that? That's a very simple and quick answer which is that and if you switch to a regenerative or conservation system, that mulch is required, and we have mulchers now. You have precision planters and mulchers. The mulchers automatically take that last four inches that they're burning, last four to six, seven inches, and they mulch it as you're seeding the next crop. So there's no time lost. They're very simple devices. They can get rid of all, uh, they're called happy seeders in Punjab. So the Punjab, the, I'm talking about now, sorry, East Punjab, so that, that side of the Punjab and Haryana in India. They're, they're starting to do it on a mass scale, and, and I think we, will, we would want to do the same. So that, that deals with the smog. Just if I can quickly say one thing on, on the fact that there's enormous use of this sort of bioenergy from methane. So methane's a very big uh, problem for us. We have a lot of livestock. So I would want to concentrate uh, the jet power generation uh, 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 using methane. I think that would be very productive. And if we can link to the next question. And maybe Imran can uh, answer that next question. You know, in already. terms of policy demand, um, you know, you, the gentleman talked about agri-mulch and stuff. Uh, in terms of really connecting very quickly to the policy demand side on regen ag, uh, if you want to add a Policy comment. Policy demand? Sorry, I didn't So understand. he was talking about, you know, doing these. Oh, will this happen yeah. at scale? I think from my side, my approach is uh, generate the evidence and talk about it nonstop to people <laughs> till they buckle. <laughs> right. I don't have a better, better approach than that. So uh, on the last uh, sort of question in terms of credible information and what's the government, you know, the role of the government, uh, you want to take that? So uh, that, that, I mean, I think it's a really interesting question. It's something that has fundamentally changed in our societies in the last 20 years, the sources of information that people have, what they believe. I'm uh, old enough to remember well, when the internet was invented. And, uh, you know, at the time, people thought that uh, everybody would find out the truth. But the one mistake that we made there was that we thought that people would look at many different sources of information and actually see, well, these two are contradictory. One of them must be right, one of them must be wrong. And the issue is that people typically don't look at multiple sources of information. Now, how you regulate the market for information is a really tough challenge because you run up into issues of like who determines what's right and wrong information. There's huge gray areas here. But clearly, when we think about regulation of firms, we think about competition you might not want to have competition in the market for information. I think that's still very much up for debate. That may be a, a one market where we want to use different types of regulatory policies. But mm -hmm. clearly the fact that people are so siloed and get access to very, a, a lack of diverse information is, is a huge challenge for societies and you know, the translation of evidence into, into policy as well. So I'll take uh, next three questions, and those are going to be uh, the last three questions we take because I want to be conscious of time, and it's been a long day. But Dr. Alia, we can start with you. Um, my question is about. <laughs> Gee, my question is about the working of uh, rural labor markets, and I don't think we really 
understand how labor markets work in the rural areas. There has been work on uh, rural labor markets from more of a sociological, anthropological uh, perspective. So I would like to know, for example, when World Bank conducts the labor market diagnostic studies, what do they uh, tell about the labor markets of Pakistan? Because the issue with agricultural worker statistics is that, yes, labor force survey is a household survey, and it does not tie the information of the agricultural worker with land holding or imports or any other uh, you know, variable. The agricultural census is long overdue. And it's not, uh, it's a census, it's not periodic enough. Um, you mentioned the NSCR. Um, yes, it was very interesting uh, when uh, we were trying to, uh, through a data sharing protocol mechanism at Ministry of Poverty Alleviation and Social Safety to look at uh, informal economy and agricultural worker characteristics from NSCR. We found out that the agricultural work module was not implemented right. uniformly. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a very well-designed module, uh, and it would be very useful to understand the kind of human capital and productivity issues that Imran and you both have raised, but uh, it's patchy. Uh, however, the PSLM data, which is now available on a district level, is better, but again, it doesn't uh, triangulate with the other uh, statistics uh, for agricultural work. So if you could both throw some light on the working of rural labor markets, it would be good. Thank you, Anand. Right. Um, next question. Uh, are we collecting questions, sorry. Yeah. Okay. You can comment on this. I want to jump into this. Both I can also you know. say something. But. Uh, this is Mani Mehmed, a digital marketing expert. Uh, no doubt, uh, climate change has been affecting the whole world. But when it comes to Pakistan, uh, uh, a flood has caused uh, uh, wreck a havoc. And what type of steps could have been taken by the government to mitigate the effects of flood? Thank you so much. Okay. Last question. I guess we exhausted uh, the question. Well, one more. Uh, Imran Zia from Sir. Uh, a very simple question. Uh, does greater agency through local governments lead to poverty reduction and human capital accumulation, mm -hmm. nice. especially in the rural context? Great. All right. One more question there. I don't know if you're remembering all of them. I hope so. I, I think we, uh, we have done? our three questions. Okay, so great. Let's. So le let me start with the with the rural labor market. I would disagree with your statement that we don't know that much about them. I think we have decades of very good work, really fine tuning. So I'd be I'd be curious to know which aspect of rural labor markets you think we we, we know approximately nothing about. Of course, data is patchy. Of course, data is imperfect. But I don't think data is the number one constraint mm. for us to study these issues. And I'm going to say this not because Ghazal is here, but you know, organizations at the World Bank have done an amazing amount of work. If we just take a step back and say we have LSMS studies for around the world that researchers and policymakers can use that allow us to make cross-country comparisons, and that's just one of many examples of data sets that we've had invested in by the World Bank and other organizations that are, allow us to even have these conversations, to even say, look, there are contradictions in these two data sets, or this seems to be missing, or we could have had that module designed better. We can say that because relative to work that we do see, we, 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 we view you know, there, there being scope for improvement. So you know, I think that's a really important thing to, to bear in mind. And sometimes amongst researchers, there's a little bit too much of a rush to go and collect our own data without looking at what's actually already available um, and say, I want to design my own survey that then in a sense doesn't allow for cross-country comparisons or even cross-regional comparisons. So it's a... It's a hark back to thinking about when we collect data, we should do that in some kind of coordinated way mm. amongst researchers. And this is always what I tell funders of research. Don't fund one project, fund 10,
but then make sure that those 10 teams are talking to each other and doing things in a way that generates much more knowledge than you get from one study uh, by itself. So I kind of disagree with your contention to start with because I don't see data as being um, the first order concern. I think we have lots of good data, thanks to organizations like the World Bank and others. You want to come in on um, that? Yeah, no. I should just say what he said. <laughs> But no, look, we can always improve the data at the same time, right? And I think this is a continuous process. I wasn't only talking about data. Ah. For example, the wage determination mechanism, ah. they're not even recognized as workers working in agriculture. Oh, so it's not a data identity. issue. They are not uh, recipients of any uh, worker-related social protection benefits, occupational safety and health is a big issue out there in the field. The uh, cotton-picking women get a lot of diseases from pesticides. I'm talking about uh, all those labor I see, I see. which are totally ignored in policy making when we talk of agricultural workers. You know, so we need to focus more on recognizing that those workers have an identity. They need to be treated mm. at par with Very important. other no, so then I just want to strongly agree with you. I think that's exactly right. And there's also a feminization as far as agriculture goes, and we need to kind of understand that much more deeply. I think I maybe didn't address that in the beginning. It's a huge issue. Yeah, and I think it's a good point about, you know, sort of uh, the role of evidence, but the linkage to policy and... and yeah, it's uh, a huge issue. So um, in terms of the local government question, um, we talked about it in our pre-session, yeah. but we didn't get yeah. to it in this. Um, you know, how does that give agency to people and uh, you know lead to yeah. rural development? I, so, I mean, I would say that uh, empowered local governments uh, are incredibly important um, for improved outcomes uh, on, on the welfare spectrum, right, across the board. And there's, there's decent evidence on this. I mean, it's not just, uh, the, not community-based so much, but having empowered, functioning, accountable local governments. We need accountable local, there's no question in my mind about it, right? And you can't just devolve a responsibility, you have to devolve resources. Um, and if you do that, then there is a good bit of evidence that that can help, right? And there are some countries in Latin America that are very good examples of that. And primary healthcare services, other things that have really improved. All right, so I'm going to, you know, incredibly grateful to both Imran and Ghazala to, you know, this has been a long day and especially, uh, you know, a hall full of people in terms of, uh, you know, sticking it out. Uh, I think two, three key things really, uh, you know, I think Imran really pressed on the thing about, you know, productivity being the, the, the you know, sort of, uh, leading work, if you will, in terms of thinking around uh, productivity gains for rural uh, development, uh, thinking about human capital accumulation, and then uh, you know, around maternal health, and what effects it has downstream for you know, our uh, development of people and places. So uh, thanks a lot again. Uh, thank you, Imran and Ghazala, for joining us so late and, and doing it on the, on the day that you flew in to uh, Lahore. And thank you, everyone, for your time.